What if you could work with some of the world's most innovative companies, all from the comfort of a remote workplace? Andela has matched thousands of technologists across the globe to their next career adventure. We're empowering new talent worldwide, from Sao Paulo to Egypt and Lagos to Warsaw. Now, the future of work is yours to create. Anytime, anywhere, the world is at your fingertips. This is Andela. Hello everyone, Ranjan here. Today I'll be taking a session on gotchas and a few best practices in Golang. So let's get started. To start with, this if you take a look at this snippet of code, as innocent as it may seem, it does primarily one thing. It takes in a list of numbers, or in this case it's an array of numbers, and then it prints them out and then it tries to call a square numbers function, which ends up squaring them. And then it prints the number again, and after which you're printing the output, which is squared numbers. Now, why are we doing this? Why are we printing it before and after calling the function? We'll figure out why. That's one behavior that's common to many languages where more expensive objects like arrays, lists, and other data structures are passed by reference as opposed to passed by value. So if I run this program, as you can see, the numbers that I had passed were one, two, three, four, five, and minus six. And that's what has been printed here. And that was what was passed to square numbers to obtain the result. But the funny part over here is when you go inside and then you look at the logic of this, what you're doing here is you're squaring the numbers and storing it in the same array. So when you're doing that, it points to the same memory location as the array that was passed. So since it was a pass by reference, the original location gets updated. And on calling this, even though it returns the same array with the squared numbers, at this point, squared numbers and numbers have the same reference. That's the reason why the numbers and square numbers that are printed after have the same values. Even if you look at the addresses, it'll remain the same. So one thing to be careful of is when you pass trucks or when you pass arrays or any other objects that are not primitive types, always consider the possibility of pass by reference. And especially if the function that you're passing the input to is manipulating the input in some way and reusing the variable, it could cause problems later. So keep a keen eye on that regard. Moving on, when we talk about this example, it's pretty straightforward. You have a array of variables similar to the previous example. You're printing it out, and then you're calling a function called R positive numbers where you pass it. And inside that, the gist of the logic is to check if everything within the past input array is positive. If it's positive, it's gonna return true, else it's gonna return false. So with such a simple example, it, as innocent as it may look, it iterates through the numbers, it checks if any of the numbers while iterating is less than zero, then it sets the result to false, prints it out and breaks. What would we expect as the answer for this? Since it contains a negative number, we would expect the result to be false. It's not gonna be all positive, but the actual result is true. And why is that? We're gonna look at that. So what is happening here is, it enters this place, this if loop, and the proof of that is this print statement, result and result is set to false. But one minor detail over here is the fact that we are redeclaring that variable. That's what colon equal to is a shorthand notation for. So when we are doing that, this local variable within this scope shadows this variable. 
So any result reference in these two lines is a reference to this result, not this result. So that is another thing to be careful of. It may seem ridiculously um, small, but it can cause problems like what we saw here. So to fix this, we shouldn't be redeclaring the variable. We should be reinitializing the variable. And when we do that, we get the actual result as desired. So be careful when redeclaring variables using the shorthand notation. It can get a bit tricky in terms of shadowing, variable shadow. Okay, moving on. Coming to slices, one of my favorite parts of Go. We have an array of strings over here of names. And over here, when I say names of colon two, I'm basically taking a subset of the original array, right? A slice of it. And when I take the slice, I would like to see whether the slice produces a completely new string array or whether it only refers to the original string array. Hence, I'm these details, right? I'm printing the length of the names as well as the new names, which are supposed to be a subset, the capacity of it, and the address of it. Let's see what it looks like. So if you take a look over here, for names, the length is 4, the capacity is 4, and the address ends in 040. Whereas for the new names, which are supposed to be the slice, the length is 2, right? Since we are cutting it colon 2, it's only going to take the values in the index 0 and 1, which makes complete sense. But the capacity is 4. How is that possible? Isn't it supposed to be smaller? This answers it. It's 0, 4, 0, the same address as the original array. So any changes that you make to the slice the variable, the sliced portion of the string array that you store in new names will affect the original array. So you got to be careful while slicing arrays or any other data structures as it can affect the original data structure. Moving on, something as innocent as getting the length of the string, right? We just go ahead and say len of the string. But in certain cases, especially when you have Unicode characters, emojis, symbols, the, the len output is basically the number of bytes. It's no longer the number of characters. A clear proof of it is running this. You see the length of that particular string, even though visually it's one character, it's three. So a safer way to actually measure the length of the string, if you are expecting any Unicode characters like these, is to use run count in string and not len. So that's also another thing to note. Now, coming to logical operators. <laughs> in uh, Python, Java, and a lot of other languages, you may have used the exclamation mark or even the tilde symbol for not operation. But in um, Golang specifically, it uses the mountain symbol or the caret symbol for not as well as XOR. So that is something to note. When it is used in a unary sense, it's taken as a not, op not operator. When it's used in a binary sense with two operands on either side, it's taken as an XOR operator. So that is something to note as well. So when you see it like this, you may be wondering what this is. And in some languages, this is also used for exponen exponentiation to say this can be interpreted as one part two in some of the languages. So that's something to note over here. And this is an interesting problem. Let's say, I'm iterating through a range of numbers. And within that, I'm using a switch case to see if any number that I'm iterating through, any of the numbers that I'm iterating through, is the maximum possible unsigned integer value. If that's the case, there is no way for me to compute the sum in the same in a variable of the same capacity. So I'm just going to set the sum to max uint and break. That's the desired behavior over here. So for that particular scenario, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just say sum is equal to max uint break. And then after that, since the sum value has been set, it has to print here. And what I'm expecting over here is for it to break and come out of the loop. But that's exactly what that's exactly what doesn't happen. So if I run this snippet of code, oops, sorry about that. So if I run the snippet of code, 
you see the result is 9 there is a value here called max u end right which maximizes the sum and there's 9 how can we explain that whenever it identifies max u end it sets the sum to max u end and what are the remaining values 1 2 3 4 and what are the sum of it 7 9 10 right so when you overflow past the maximum value you start from 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 values basically and that's the reason why the sum is 9 it is basically overflown and that's definitely not a desired behavior so in order to fix this when you want to break out of for switch cases like this and break out of the loop the way to approach this problem is to use something that all of us would have seen in much older languages labels so if you take a look here oh, sorry about that yeah so if you take a look here i set a label for this group of statements right for this particular for loop and whenever i want to break out of the for loop i just specify the label along with the break keyword so that tells me i need to break out of the statements contained within that label so that exits the loop now if i run it right when it iterates through this list or this array it hits a max maximum unsigned integer value in that scenario it sets the sum to that and it just breaks the loop which should exit the loop and then the sum should be the maximum unsigned integer value with a lot of digits right so keep that in mind whenever you talk about nested loops or even uh, for switch scenarios consider using labels to break out okay next one we're moving to a very very uh, interesting part of go using the defer keyword to run tasks after everything else in the function is done so considering this particular scenario let's see how the call argument evaluation works for defer in this particular scenario if you take a look we have a list of strings basically a bunch of names that we want to pass to the say goodbye function which ends up just printing goodbye followed by the name and how are we passing the array of strings over there we using strings dot join and we are passing it now since i have defer over here this method say goodbye is basically going to be executed after the main method its content is processed so over here if i change the value of the names which is evaluated as a part of the argument to the function is it going to affect the argument that goes into say goodbye if this change is going to affect it then he's no longer going to be called albus he'll be called goodbye mega bus perceivable wolfred bryant dumbledore whereas if any changes post the defer statement does not affect the arguments provided to the defer function at that point of time we can be sure that it's evaluated right here so let's run it and check it out perfect we have his original name so what does that tell us it tells us that the argument evaluation for defer statements are done then and there so plan accordingly while writing code you cannot change the code or the arguments the variables that are referred to in the arguments after the defer statement and expect that to be passed so uh, moving on another very very uh, simple uh, fact uh, whenever we use defer statements it uh, the behavior is like a stack when we stack multiple defer statements whatever is the last function that's deferred is what runs first so it's as though you're stacking up the deferred functions in a stack so last and first out so first when i run this code it first defers printing first defer and then it then defers printing second defer and then since this is the last function that's function call that's put into the stack that gets executed first followed by the other one so it prints second defer followed by first defer so that's pretty much the order of execution of defer statements in a leaf for form 
in a leaf form fashion. Okay, moving on. When we talk about iteration variable closure, especially in the context of a differ, right? I'm taking the same example of a list of names and I'm iterating through that. And then I'm going to check out over here to see if I print the index and the name within uh, this, it's, it'll be interesting to note this and differ as well. My bad. I, this is an example for the Go keyword where we are actually running subroutines. What is the value that it would take? That is the question. So when we run this piece of code, you see it has taken the last value for all iterations. It doesn't do it for each loop because what happens is this runs pretty fast. And when the subroutines kick in, right, whatever is the latest value in index and name gets referred to over here within the subroutines. So to prevent this from happening, right, what you do is you need to redeclare those variables and then use them in the subroutine if you want to take that route. So say I have index copy and then I have name copy, right? And then here I'm going to use index copy and here I'm going to use name copy and let's see what happens now. Perfect. It's out of order because just because we kick off subroutines, it doesn't mean all of them will occur one after the other. It occurs concurrently. Some may terminate before, some may terminate after. So the order will not be preserved, but at least you're getting the different values as the output over here, which was the expected behavior. Okay, moving on. When we talk about recovering panics in general in Golang, one important thing to note is you cannot recover panics from panics by just calling recover in the same context of a panic or even after it. So when you panic, that's when it basically the panic propagates. It's like throwing an exception or error in other languages. It's going to go up the call stack. So one way to actually prevent panicking is not by doing this. This will continue. It'll panic and it'll tell, hey, OMG, oh my God. So if you want to go ahead and prevent that from happening, the approach to take is by recovering in a defer call. So here I have a function that I've deferred for execution until the rest of the contents in main has been executed. And within that, I'm calling the recover function. And then I'm panicking, OMG. So let's see what happens. In this scenario, perfect. It has recovered and it has also printed out the output of the recover call, which is the panic that has been recovered, that it has recovered from. So if you ever want to recover from panics, you don't use recover in the same place. You use it in a differ. Moving on. Last but not least. Okay. Oh, perfect. I think we're done. So please feel free to reach out if you have any questions, any comments, any concerns. And I'll be uploading this to a Git repository, GitHub specifically, on GitHub. And I'll share the link. So it'll contain all the sample codes. You could play around with it. And it will not only contain this, eventually I'll add a lot more uh, Go gotchas and best practices. So uh, please feel free to take a look, reach out to me and I would love to hear from you. So thank you for your time and hope to see you soon in another conference.